Genesis 27. And <clears throat> this is going to deal a little bit, well, primarily with persecution. Persecution. Why do... Well, let me ask it to you this way. Do you honestly believe that there are people out there who, if they could do it and get away with it, would try to kill every born-again Christian in this world today? You guys are crazy. Conspiracy theory people. Oh, yeah. Um... Yeah, I believe that because it's biblical. And um, Jesus said, if, if men hate you, don't worry about it. They hated me long before they hated you. And uh, they're not really angry at you. They're angry at me. And um, sometimes that's not how I take it when I've got somebody yelling in my face uh, about something. But. It is, it is the fact that they hate Jesus. So, in this story of Jacob and Esau, and it falls along the same lines, I mentioned this last Sunday night, along the same lines of uh, Isaac and Ishmael. Ishmael, remember, he was the firstborn son, but he was a child of bondage because his mother was a bond servant, a slave, to uh, Sarah. Probably at some point she had been bought by Abraham. Or how, I'll say it to you the way Fredericktown people. At some point she had been bought in the slave market. That sounds more Fredericktonian, doesn't it? He was bought. Okay. I just want to be able to speak your langu language so you understand me. Uh, but anyway, it falls along the same lines here. If you look in Genesis 27, uh, verse 41, before we read anything, let's go to prayer. Ask God to bless his word for us. Uh, tell God, thank you for being faithful to you, for always keeping his promise to you, for never letting you fail, never letting you uh, or never failing you, never... Uh, Never forsaking you, always being there with you in one form or another. Uh, just tell him thank you for that. Heavenly Father, we are glad to come together again uh, to this service. We thank you, God, for the way that you open our eyes to things that we never saw before, things we never thought about before, things that we just we didn't even know was in the Bible. Lord, there is so much here. And Lord, you know my brain, you know my thoughts and how it works, God. And I want to I want to know things. I want to see things. I want to understand the, the goings on in this world. And Father, I thank you for the journey that I've been on so far. And Lord, I do look forward to the journey that you will put me on from this day forward. Thank you, God, for the Bible that leads us all and guides us all and gives us great and precious promises until the day of the return of Jesus Christ when we will no longer need this body, we'll no longer use it, and we won't even have to carry Bibles around. Your word will be written in our heart. Lord, we look forward to that day, but until that day comes, help us to tarry, help us to be patient, help us to wait. And always help us to be about our Father's business. And give us, Father, the grace to understand that our labor, our work, is never in vain. Bless your word tonight, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Now, in verse 41, Genesis 27, uh, Esau, Jacob has now gotten away with Taking, number one, the birthright, and number two, the fatherly blessing. He has taken that away from Esau, but that was all part of God's knowledge 
and God's planning. He was going to pick, uh, in fact, he already had, he had picked Jacob, and he had uh, sort of turned his back on Esau, knowing what Esau would do with his life, with his decisions, how bullheaded and stubborn and everything else that Esau was. If you've ever, if you've ever talked to a man or a woman about Jesus and got nothing but hatred and vileness and get out of my house type stuff, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, there was a young lady out at the Richwood Church where I pastored. And she, during a vacation Bible school, she gave her life to the Lord. And uh, she wanted to be baptized. So uh, myself and the deacon on a Thursday night went out to where um, I guess it was her mom and dad lived. And uh, she wasn't, the, the young lady wasn't there at the time. Her mom was and... So I figured, well, I better let them in on what's going on. So I told the mom about, you know, their daughter getting saved. Then I, I figured, you know what? While she's here, I'll give her the gospel. And I start trying to explain the gospel to this woman. And I'm thinking, you know, maybe we can, you know, through this, the mom can be saved. And I don't know the dad, but maybe he can be saved too. You know, I, I just, I wanted to see people saved. And I got to the point where I was asking this woman, you know, your daughter made a decision for Christ. Don't you think it's time that you make a decision for Jesus as well? And you and your daughter can have a relationship like you've never had before. She said, well, hold on a second. Let me go get my husband in on this. Now, he knew I was there. And she went down into a room and about two minutes later, he come out. Now, we're in the living room. He comes out to the kitchen. And he's standing up, leaning up against the wall like this. And I, he's, he said, what do you guys want? And I'm, was, I could tell by the look on his face. I said, well, sir, I just was explaining to your wife here about your daughter. And how she gave her life to Jesus. I went through the scriptures with her. And I'd like to go through them with you if you'll give me the chance to. And, and, and give you God's free offer of salvation. And he looked me in the eye. And he said, I know who you are. I know where your church is. And if I feel like coming to your church, I'll come to your church. Other than that, I didn't invite you in here. I don't really want you here. And he turned around and walked off. Well, that pretty much leaves us without a choice. And when we, we did exactly that, when we walked out of his house, we were wiping our hands and kicking the dirt off our shoes. And that was... Uh, I'd never been talked to that way before by uh, on the salvation issue i've been talked to that way by other people on other things but not on salvation and i said you know what's odd is that when this man dies his family is going to find a, per a preacher somewhere that'll make everybody believe that he's in heaven i said it probably won't be me though and I've not heard from them. Young lady never did come back. She never was baptized. She never came back to church. And uh, that man's going to stand before God one of these days and give an account for that. So anyway, I want you to understand that lost people will have in them a different spirit than saved people have. The Bible tells us that, it warns us about that, and uh, we're, we'll look at that shortly. Um, Esau hated Jacob because of the blessing wherewith his father blessed him. 
So it tells you in the text, the one reason, the one reason why Esau hated Jacob. What was, what was the one reason why Esau hated him? Because of the blessing. Jacob was going to receive a blessing and Esau was not going to receive that same blessing. And it made him angry. In actuality, does he have anybody to be angry with other than himself? Not really. Not really. It was foolish of him to ask his brother to give him a bowl of lentils and then sell his birthright for it because he, you know, he makes up this ordeal. I'm famished. I'm starving to death. What good does a birthright do me if I can't enjoy it, if I'm dead? You know, and he made, he made this big thing out of it. Truth is, he could have gone on for days without any more food. Or, lazy old ape, why don't you get up and make it yourself? Okay? But from that moment on, he began to hate his brother. And I, I will, I know this to be a fact. Because of the work in Kenya, I have been made aware that we are hated, not just disliked, hated by some of the men in power in power of the Seventh-day Adventist cult, the Roman Catholic cult, those that follow the uh, false prophet Dr. Awar cult. And just by me speaking out on those false doctrines and, and those cults, they hate me. And, and it, I, I don't want to... I don't want to say this, but it, it just wouldn't surprise me if there wasn't a contract next time I go over there. Um, simply because all I'm going to do is present the gospel and give it away for free. Whereas everybody else has to pay for it somehow, some way. And that makes me angry. And Esau said in his heart, the days of mourning for my father are at hand. Then will I slay my brother Jacob. In other words, we're going to wait whatever, however many days, 40 days or whatever. We're going to wait 40 days. But when those 40 days are up, I'm going to kill my brother. That's all there is to it. I'm going to kill him. So verse 42, in these words of Esau, her elder son, were told to Rebekah. And she sent and called Jacob, her younger son, and said unto him, Behold, thy brother Esau is touching thee, doth comfort himself, purposing to kill thee. Now therefore, my son, obey my voice and arise. Flee thou to Laban, my brother, to Haran. And tarry with him a few days. Remember, th this is Rebekah. This is where she came from. She came from Haran. And her brother was Laban. Okay, it's just so you remember that. Because we're going to see it again. Um, he said, um, verse 46, And Rebekah said to Isaac, I am weary of my life, watch this now, because of the daughters of Heth. If Jacob take a wife of the daughters of Heth, such as these, which are the daughters of the land, what good shall my life do me? Now let's go back uh, to chapter, chapter 26. Look at verse 34. It's not really something I, we paid attention to when we went in this direction the other day. But those last two verses, Esau was 40 years old. When he took to wife Judith, the daughter of Beeri, the Hittite, the children of Heth are the Hittites. And Bashemoth, the daughter of Elon, the Hittite. 
Now, go to um, Deuteronomy. Chapter 7, I believe. Yeah. Deuteronomy chapter 7. When the Lord thy God shall bring thee into the land whither thou goest to possess it, and hath cast out many nations before thee, the Hittites are the first people on the list. The Hittites, the Girgashites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, seven nations greater and mightier than thou. God said, when you get into that land and you see them, I want them dead. And then he said, verse 2, When the Lord thy God shall deliver them before thee, thou shalt smite them and utterly destroy them. What does utterly mean? All the way. Utterly destroy them, and thou shalt make no covenant with them, nor show mercy unto them. And then look at verse 3. Neither shalt thou make marriages with them. Thy daughter thou shalt not give unto his son, nor his daughter shalt thou take unto thy son. For watch this. For they will turn away thy son from following me, that they may serve other gods. So, so will the anger of the Lord be kindled against you and destroy thee suddenly. So now go back uh, to uh, chapter 27. Verse 46. This is, the, this is why Rebekah said what she said. Because Esau married two women out of the, the people of the Hittites. And those were a, a nation that was not in favor with God. And it's very possible that Esau did this just out of pure rebellion against his parents. Just pure rebellion. And he marries these two women, and you can see the grieving in Rebecca's heart. She's, she's going, that boy, that boy, that boy. I don't know what I'm going to do with him. He's like a wild animal. I can't tame him. Can't tell him to do anything. Goes in one ear, out the other. Pays no mind to me and his father whatsoever. And then to top it all off, he goes out and marry, marries two Hittite women. Now that would be, the, the analogy would be like, oh, if Matthew hadn't ever met Paige and Matthew found a couple girls at Hillsborough High School that liked him, and they were both practicing witchcraft. And I found out about it. I'd say to you, son, are you dumb or what? What is wrong with you? You wouldn't let your children marry somebody whose gods are not your God, their ways are not your ways, their thoughts are not your thoughts. You, you just wouldn't do it. And that's what's going on here. Rebecca says to Jacob, you need to go to my brother's house and to my, um, my father's house, Haran, and tarry there Wait till Esau's anger turns away from you. And while you're there, find you a good wife. Because I won't, I won't do well. In verse 46, Rebekah said to Isaac, I'm weary of my life because of the daughters of Heth. If Jacob take a wife of the daughters of Heth, such as these which are the daughters of the land, what good shall my life do me? You can go and ask a lot of people in this country and a lot of people in a lot of countries. 
did your children marry well or did they not marry well or whatever. And in some cases, you actually have where the mother-in-law or the father-in-law acts now as an enemy against you and your family. I have a, had a situation from a family that has been following our ministry for several years. They've homeschooled their children. They had three children. They homeschooled them. A very close-knit family. Uh, the mom and dad had a, a family business. And the children worked in the business and did their schoolwork and everything. But over time, the man was telling me, boy, you got to pray for us, Pastor Mike. What's going on? And he would say, my mother-in-law, she's a witch. I said, well, I can understand, you know, how some women are kind of bad. No, 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 you're not. She is a witch, a real witch. Practicing lesbian witch. And you know what that mother-in-law was doing? She hated that family so much because of Christ Jesus that she actively began to work behind the scenes they had two daughters and a son to actively work behind the scenes to turn those children's hearts away from their own mom and dad. The youngest daughter, this, this atheist, witch, lesbian grandmother sent four girls into this family business to try to turn over this youngest daughter to lesbianism. The fifth one worked. There was something about this fifth girl that they just connected. And, I mean, they confessed this to me in my office. Before it was all said and done, she had already ruined her life with this other girl. And I'm just telling you people, the enemies are everywhere. And if, uh, I like this verse. Ephesians 2. Turn there and underline it. It's a great verse for you to memorize. It's a good verse for you to understand why there are certain family members you probably shouldn't have anything to do with. Now, I know that sounds mean. I know that sounds uh, closed-minded. I don't care. In Ephesians 2, verse 2, And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air. And what he's saying here is that everybody in this room at one time walked according to the course that Satan let out for you. You did exactly what Satan told you to do. And you enjoyed it. You enjoyed it. That's why you went out and did it again. The prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by uh, nature the children of wrath, even as others. But God, who is rich in what? Mercy. For his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ by grace ye are saved. Amen to that. Now, meanwhile, back at the ranch. So, uh, Esau's made a deal. 
when the days of my father's mourning is over with, I'm going to kill my brother. So here we now have a, a second example. The first example we had was Ishmael and Hagar that hated uh, Isaac and Sarah. Now we have a similar situation. We have the two sons of Isaac and one of the sons of Isaac, Esau, hates the other son of Isaac, Jacob, and threatens to kill him. As soon as we're done mourning, I'm going to kill you. And nothing is going to stop me. So when his mother tells him, I think you need to pack your bags and go to my father's house to where my brother is, I think you need to stay over there for a while until Esau gets over this thing, which may take a long time, but until he gets over this thing, you need to get out of town. And that is exactly what he did. Turn to the book of Acts very quickly. Several years ago, I can't remember what led me into this study, but I got to looking at all the persecution that was taking place to the early church in the book of Acts. And I discovered one very important thing that absolutely for the most part in the book of Acts, the people who hated the Christians, the most, were not the Roman soldiers. They were not the Roman governors. They were the Jews. They were the Jews. I'm going to give you some examples. Acts 7, 54 uh, when they had heard these things, they were cut to the heart. This is Stephen after he's testified. And they gnashed on him with their teeth. See, these guys, man, these guys are devil-possessed. They literally was biting him like dogs would. They gnashed on him with their teeth. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked, uh, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God. And said, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Oh, I bet that made the Jews feel better about themselves, didn't it? No, Stephen just handed them a gas, uh, can of gasoline. Said, Pour it on the fire. So, verse uh, 57, Then they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon him with one accord and cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet, whose name was Saul. To me, that is one of the most interesting, um, what do they call it? What's the word I'm looking for? It's just one of the most interesting, it's not an, it's not an accident, it's a coincident, but it's a purposeful incident. God had Saul at that place at that time to watch what they did to Stephen. And Saul was consenting unto his death, the Bible says. Anyway, they cast him out of the city and the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was Saul. And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. That's what I, that is the last thing that I want to say in this world. Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. You know who he's acting like here? Jesus. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. In other words, he died. 
And here's a young man by the name of Saul who's watching these Jewish godly men that he so adored it throughout his life act like they are full of devils. Pick up Stephen, throw him out of the city, start grabbing huge stones, pelting those stones down upon him while they were asking Saul, Saul, hold my coat. And Saul watched Stephen, and he also listened to what Stephen said. I see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of the Father. And I'm pretty sure that never left Paul the rest of his life. Never left him. In Acts chapter 9, uh, to me, this is Saul trying to soothe over the trouble and the pain and the anguish that he had when he helped participate in the stoning of Stephen. He says, I'll be militant more than all of them and I'll show God who's really on his side. So Acts chapter 9 verse 1, And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went into the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound into Jerusalem. Saul says, I'm going to go catch me a bunch of them Christians. I'm going to bring them back and we're just going to have a little hanging party. He wants these people dead because in his mind, remember, what spirit is he following right now? The spirit of God or the prince of the power of the air? The spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. And then you know the story. Before he ever gets to Damascus, he's on the road to Damascus. And what happened? Jesus himself appeared to him and told him, Saul, whatever you think you're going to do, you're not going to do it. I died for all those people. I gave my blood for those people. And I died for you too. And you're going to be my voice among the Gentiles. So in Acts chapter 9, verse 22, now that Saul, he's gotten to Damascus, he's uh, gaining in strength, the scales have fallen off his eyes and so on. But Saul increased the more in strength and, and confounded the Jews which dwelt at Damascus, proving that this is very Christ. In other words, He's showing all these synagogue Jews through the only Bible they had, which was the Old Testament. And he's shown them everywhere in the Old Testament where Jesus was. And, and he's just blowing these guys away. And they either love Paul for doing that and say, Paul, please tell us more about this Jesus. Show us in the scriptures where he is, who he is, what he is. And then you've got others going... Oh, I'm going, to, I'm going to kill him for that. That's blasphemy. And so, verse 23, And after that, many days were fulfilled. The Jews took counsel to kill him. But their laying in wait was known of Saul, and they watched the gates day and night to kill him. But did they, did, did they kill him? No. But remember, who wants to kill, the, who wants to kill Paul? It wasn't the Romans. It wasn't the Roman governors. They didn't want anything to do with it. The same thing with Pontius Pilate. He wanted nothing to do with putting Jesus on a cross. He wanted nothing to do with it. But he figures, well, if I'm going to, you know, Caesar sent me down here to keep peace. And if I can't keep peace and these people revolt, he's going to have my job for sure. He's going to have somebody else Wearing my, wearing my uniform. But it was the Jews. Acts chapter 12. Now about that time, Herod the king stretched forth his... Who is Herod? Is he a Jew? Yes, he's a Jew. Herod the king stretched forth his hands to vex certain of the church. And he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. Because he saw it pleased who? The Jews. He proceeded further to take Peter also. Then were the days of unleavened bread. And when he had apprehended him, 
He put him in prison, delivered him to four quaternions of soldiers to keep him, intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. Peter, therefore, was kept in prison. This one man needs four quaternions of soldiers to guard him. Oh, he's a dangerous man, isn't he? And uh, verse 5, Peter therefore was kept in prison, but praying was made, prayer was made with, without ceasing of the church unto God for him. And when Herod would have brought him forth, the same night Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains, and the keepers before the Lord kept the prison, or before the door kept the prison. And behold, the angel of the Lord came upon him, and a light shined in the prison, and he smote Peter on the side, and raised him up, saying, Arise quickly, and his chains fell off from his hands. And the Roman soldier, still asleep, walked Peter out of that prison, let him out of that prison, and Peter's going, Okay, where do I go? And he knows the place where he goes. There's family there, and brothers and sisters there. And so everybody is in the house hiding from, from the Jews. They're hiding from Roman soldiers. They don't want to be captured and put in jail because they're Christians. So they're in there hiding. Well, here comes a knock on the door. Young damsel answers the door. Because <gasps> it's Peter, right? Mama says, who's at the door? Peter! Smack. I told you about that lion. <laughs> Quit your lion. Who's at the door? It's Peter. They, they, they thought for sure the man would be dead. But the Jews wanted him dead. Acts chapter 13, verse 44. The next Sabbath day came almost the whole city together to hear the word of God. Well, I'd love to have a revival service like that. But when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy and spake against those things which were spoken by Paul, contradicting and blasphemy. Now, let me tell you something. Now, I, haven't, I haven't touched on this in a long time, either um, you know, in any of these services or in any of the things I do upstairs. But the Hebrew Roots movement is still growing. And it's taking people in. And I'm going to tell you, the roots of the Hebrew roots doctrine does not come from the Bible. It comes from Jewish rabbis. And the reason why it's coming from Jewish rabbis is those Jewish rabbis, number one, they hate Jesus Christ. Number two, they hate the New Testament. They can't stand it. They hate it. Number three, they hate the Gentiles who read the New Testament and believe in Jesus Christ. And they hate us. And I believe that their plan to subvert the true gospel of Christ. You can already see it in Galatians. When you read the book of Galatians, you know what you're going to see? Hebrew root mo movement moving through those churches, getting them... To believe that through law keeping and grace, God then will bless you. And Paul said, uh uh. It's either of grace or of works, but it cannot be both. Amen? Amen. So, uh, yeah, they got the whole city here. Verse. Um, 45, when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy, speaking against those things that were spoken by Paul, and contradicting and blaspheming. Then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said, It was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you, but seeing you put it from you, and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. Now, people, this Bible is still right to this day. And you have preacher after preacher turning themselves away from the word of God. I, I dare say that a large portion of pastors in this country do not study their Bible. They purchase programs from, comp from publishing companies who send them materials, handouts, graphic arts, 
sermon outlines, sermon illustrations to go with it. And these guys buy those things so they don't have to study. And they preach sermons that, A, they don't know, they have no idea who wrote them. I know that happens. You have the same problem here. You have preachers who have turned away from the word of God. Um, verse 47. Uh, for so hath the Lord commanded us, saying, I have set thee to be a light of the Gentiles, that thou shouldest be for salvation unto the ends of the earth. And when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord. And as many as were ordained to eternal life believed. And the word of the Lord was published throughout all the region. But the Jews stirred up the devout and honorable women and the chief men of the city and raised persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them out of their coast. They said, get out. I don't know, but what the next time I go to Kenya, there may be people meeting me at the airport saying, get back on the plane. Um, several years ago, I went to Kenya and it was to, um, it was to pray the prayer of blessing and dedicate the well that we had dug for this community in, in Samburu. And, uh, it was just me traveling. And I, as I get off the plane and I'm going through customs, going to baggage, I see, I mean, there's gotta be thousands of Kenyans in the hallways, lined up down the walls. I walk outside, they're everywhere. And I'm going, are they here for me? I didn't think it was that big a deal. Well, I was wrong. They weren't there for me. I didn't know that the famous false prophet, Dr. O'War was on the same flight as I was in first class, okay? And they were waiting for him to get off the plane so they could bow to him and worship him and he could receive money and gifts from them and all that stuff. It was just me and Michael and Hezron. That was it. That's all there was. Um, the word of the Lord, verse 50, but the Jews stirred up the devout honorable women chief men of the city and raised persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them out of their coast. Acts 14, 19, there came thither certain Jews from Antioch and Iconium who persuaded the people and having stoned Paul, drew him out of the city, supposing he had been dead. Acts 23, 11, and the night following the Lord stood by him and said, be of good cheer, Paul, for, thou, for as thou hast testified of me in Jerusalem, so must thou bear witness also at Rome. And when it was day, certain of the Jews banded together and bound themselves under a curse, saying that they would neither eat nor drink till they had killed Paul. I imagine all those guys died. And they came to the chief priests and elders and said, We have bound ourselves under a great curse that we will eat nothing until we have slain Paul. Now therefore ye with the council signify to the chief captain that he bring him down unto you tomorrow as though you would inquire something more perfectly concerning him and we or ever he come near are ready to kill him. In other words, set him up for a trap. Make it sound like you want to hear this gospel and this Jesus that he's talking about. And as soon as he walks in the door, we're going to kill him. And you know why we're going to kill him? Because we're hungry. That's why. But those, those idiots bound themselves under a curse that they would neither eat nor drink till, till Paul was dead. It was the Jews. Now, am I anti-Semite? Not on your lot. You see, look here. I know I've got another verse on here. In fact, it's like four verses. I know it for a fact. It's the second time this has happened today. It is, huh? It's on the one up there? What is it? Second? Romans 8, 35. Turn there. Thank you, Johnny Olson. Romans 
Where was you this morning, by the way? I don't know. I don't know what happened to him. Romans 8. I want to I want to encourage you with this. Actually, I want to encourage me with this. Oh my goodness. Let's go to verse 28. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. Let's say amen to that. And I, after the service this morning, I kind of shared with one or two people some of the things I'm dealing with. That, are, that have happened uh, to people in this church. And, and it just grieves me. Grieves me. But I believe the Bible. I believe the Bible. Had it not been for God beating me nearly to death many, many years ago, I would not be here today and I would not be anywhere near the man that I am. If it was not for God putting me under what amounted to a, a first a three-day fast and prayer and then two weeks later another day of fasting and prayer, out of which came this ministry. Um... But at that time, I was ready to resign. Do this church a favor and let somebody else have it who might be able to do something with it. But God truly meant what he said. All things do work together for good. This Bible's not a joke. This Bible is real and this Bible's true. And he said, for whom he did foreknew... For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be... See, foreknowledge and predestination are the same. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, him who he did predestinate, them he also called. And whom he called, them he also justified. I want you to notice these words are in past tense. Sister Helen, God has already justified you in his sight. God has already seen the outcome of your life. And he has already placed you in the position of a justified, forgiven person. So that there will never be a sin held against you. Look at what it says. Um, he called, that's past tense. He justified, that's past tense. And whom he justified, them also he glorified. Past tense, already been done. Now, it may not have set the whole world on fire when you got saved. But I look back on my life and I can't think of anything greater than being a nine-year-old boy, giving my life to Jesus. What shall we say then to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. See, you see that verse right there? Can Satan lay anything to your charge? No. It's under the blood. He who is who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Who shall, here it is, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation? No. 
And by the way, I'm going to make this easy. This is a quiz where I'm going to give you the answer. The answer to every one of these questions is no. Shall tribulation, shall distress, shall persecution, can famine, how about nakedness, peril, the sword, for it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. You're already dead. We're, we're getting, it's a, more than that. He's not done. As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I'm persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, these are devils, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. The total sum is 17. 17. 7 in one part, 10 in the other. 17. Okay? And I, I know what that means. 17 is a number related to the rapture, the translation. And here's what God's telling you. Don't worry. Because even if they kill you, what have you lost? You haven't lost nothing. Your life now is better than it ever was. So don't worry about them killing you. Don't worry about what they take away from you. Don't worry about how bad it's going to get. God is still God. And he intends to use these things in our lives to make us better, not worse. To make us love God more, not hate God more. To be better husbands, to be better wives, to be better families to be better Christians, to be better church members, to be better evangelists, missionaries, everything that we do, everything that God does to us and through us, he does for us so that he makes us worthy to be his disciples. We all have a cross to bear. Amen? All of us. And Jesus said, except a man... Take up his cross daily and follow me is not worthy to be my disciple. He said the word daily. So there's always going to be something there that day that, you're, that by the end of the day, God's going to kill it off. And when you get done at the end of the day, lay down your head and say, God, thank you. Thank you for taking this away from me. Thank you for doing this in me. Amen. Now, let me just say this about the Jews so you don't misunderstand. This is exact. Could you name another group of people in this world who hate the gospel more than the Jews? Huh? No. Not really. The people who are most active that are trying to destroy the gospel of Jesus Christ are the Jews. But here's what I'm getting at. What better group to save than the Jews? To this day, they still have turned their backs on God. They despise God. They treat his word with such great disregard and disrespect. They practice witchcraft. They, they practice all sorts of rituals to false gods. And yet they still believe that God is their God. And they despise the New Testament. But God is willing to take those people and turn them completely around and make such a change in their life. I've told this before, but... 
I went to my brother-in-law's house one day, and he, uh, this was at a time when he was very, very deep in sin. Okay, he had women, he had drugs, he had booze, he had he had a had a business. One of the worst men in Jefferson County at that time. And God told me to go over there and give him a cassette tape of, of a message I preached. And he saw it laying there and he said, you might as well pick that up and get that thing out of here because I'm not going to listen to it. I'm going to throw it away. I said, Steve, if you throw it away, that's your business, but I'm not touching it. God told me to bring it over here and, I'm, and I've left it over here and I'm walking out without this thing in my pocket. Now, you do whatever you want to with it, but I'm going to obey God. And I did. We prayed with him, walked out and left. I don't know that he ever listened to that message. But what I do know is God turned that man around. And I, in a way, I have never, I, to this day, I marvel at that. How such a wicked, evil man could be turned completely around. And ask a man that he at one time, he could have killed me rather than seeing me. But he asked me, Mike, how do I know for sure I'm going to heaven? God's good. Amen. Let's stand to our feet. Now, none of that means that it would have been okay for Steve to bash my face in with his fist. I wouldn't have liked that. Because he told me he was going to do it. Anytime I brought up Jesus, a few days later, he said, I don't know how close, I don't know if you know how close you were to getting your head bashed in. Yeah. Father, I want to thank you, God, again. For Steve coming to my office that morning. You had already, God, you had already saved him. I saw it plain as day. God, I want to tell you thank you that the last thing that my dad ever did in this world was pray with his son. And Father, I understand that, God, there's going to be a lot of heartaches and a lot of things that we just can't, we don't have any control over. But Father, help us please to remember your promise. That if they hate us, it's not really us they hate, it's you they hate. When they persecute us, and they will, they don't know that in killing us, they have created a far worse enemy than they could have ever imagined when we come back as the ten thousands of God's saints coming back with Jesus in Revelation 19 to execute judgment on this earth. Father, in the meantime, there's some pretty bad people out there, Lord, and we'd like to see them saved. So Father, would you save them? Would you glorify yourself in them? Would you justify them and turn them completely around, God? Would you do that for them? Father, we thank you for tonight's lesson. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your word above your name. We pray this in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, amen. God bless you. You're dismissed.